Hello and welcome to the first, the very first, the starting, the beginning of the Chief Librarian podcast. I am Chris Morgan, your Chief Librarian, and I'm very happy to be here. I just wanted to take a moment here and thank Frontline Gaming for giving me the opportunity to host and barf all of my word salad all over your ear holes. Thank you all so very, very much. Now, if you are new to this podcast, which all of you are, you may be wondering why on the Frontline Gaming Network there is a show called The Chief Librarian Podcast. Well, I am here to answer all of your questions about that. The Chief Librarian Podcast is basically something that you have never seen on the Frontline Gaming Network before. And what does that mean? That means that this is a primarily narrative and lore-focused podcast, and it's hosted by me. Now, I am called many things on the internet, Mostly, I am called Captain Morgan, and some of you may recognize me from my time on the Forge the Narrative podcast. I was on there for four years, had a great time doing that. Then 2020 happened, and we all know that 2020 was not fantastic. And I won't belabor that point too much, but I will just say that it gave me a lot of opportunities to focus on the things that I love about Warhammer. And many of those things are lore related. Many of those things are gaming related. And that's what I wanted to create with this show. We have an opportunity here to focus on the things about our hobby that we love the most. And that doesn't have to be exclusive to one thing in particular now. But what does that really mean? Like, there are very few people in the Warhammer hobby, I believe who only enjoy one thing about it. Whether you are a hardcore tournament player or a dedicated GM dungeon master type of person who's only really interested when you get to play out a fantasy, really, there isn't one way that you have to like the game. But most of us have interest in several dis different aspects of the hobby. So we have people who like to read and paint. There are some people who like to paint and play. There are some people who like to paint, play, and read. And there are some people who like to build campaigns. And there are some people who like to build in tournaments. And then there's people like me who like to do all of those things at different times. And I want to share that love with you. I want to bring in interesting people to talk to about the different things that they love about this hobby. I want to talk about cool stories with you. I want to dissect interesting characters. I want to create engaging, fun gameplay and campaigns. And I'm going to talk about the stuff that I do along the way, whether that is I'm writing a short story for a Black Library submission, or I am painting like I am now. I am painting up starships for a multi-system campaign that we'll be talking about a little bit later in the show. And we are going to talk about some of the different ways, not only from a Rolling Dice is Fun podcast kind of a perspective on Warhammer 40k, but we're also going to talk about the ways that we can ensure fun happens, because really that's what a hobby is all about. So thank you so much for bearing with me up to this point. Believe me, I have a whole lot more to say. I have some very interesting conversations coming up for episode one here. So with that sort of introduction to the concept of the show out of the way, I want to you know, lay down some expectations, some things that you can expect from me. Now, one of the things that you can probably expect from me is weird audio quality from, from time to time. Now, I have a good setup. I also have a mobile setup. There's a bunch of different things to factor into audio. And where this is a new show, obviously, I'm expecting something to go wrong, probably even on this episode. So bear with me. I keep giving me feedback on that, and I'm going to keep trying to improve the way that I can do things. Next, this is going to be a clean show, and that's part of my commitment to you as the listener. Now, the rest of it is I'm basically going to try and keep you interested. I want you to like the things that I am talking about on the show. So that means that I'm going to be open to feedback. Best place to do that would be to go and like my Facebook page, Captain Morgan's Librarius, where I will be publishing the news about the show and you can message me there with show related stuff now there's going to be a variety of content that i put on here some of it's going to be strictly audio some of it is going to be video some of it is going to be photos behind audio depending on whether what podcast way that you're listening to it so podcast youtube all the different favorite ways you listen any way that you can listen to the frontline gaming network or watch the frontline gaming network Hopefully this will work out for you in the way that you enjoy the most. So far as format, 
every episode is going to have a segment like this where it's probably just me and I'm talking about all of the different things that we're going to be talking about or all of the housekeeping items that are going to have to do with the show. Then there's going to be two main segments with some breaks split up between them. And each segment is going to have a different focus, whether it's something related to a book or if it's a type of game or if it's a, a different uh, like, like a, a conversation that I have, an interview that I do like today. Today, we have two different kinds of content for you. The first one that we're going to do is going to be kind of an intro to the idea of Crusade gaming in Warhammer 40K. Now, all of you who play Warhammer 40K know that there is a section in your codex if you have a codex that's out yet and if you have a rule book which you probably do there's a section in there that talks about narrative gaming and what is that called it's called crusade and crusade is basically how you play rpgs with your whole army it has a whole bunch of different systems in there and so what what we're going to do in the first segment is i have a couple of guests coming on some locals to my area who are going to join me as we create together a multi-system crusade campaign that will incorporate fleet battles, kill team operations, and a wide variety of other fun, interesting ways of incorporating multiple styles of play into Warhammer 40k. So uh, I have Zach and Rich are going to join me for the first segment. We're going to basically go over a summary of crusade, what it does, how it does it, and talk a little bit about the armies we're going to play and what we hope to get out of our narrative campaign. So I, I really hope that you enjoy that conversation. Zach and Rich are great people. Now it's going to get more confusing because we have a fourth player who is also named Rich, Rich Kilton, who will be bringing his orcs in. Now some of you may recognize Rich's name. He's been in the top, running for the top orc spot or the top orc spot in the ITC for pretty much ever. And he is a decades-long orc player and probably the orkiest human being that is alive now, which is saying something considering orcs are made up and he is a real person. So that's fantastic. I've, I'm actually really excited to play with him. We may just have to call him Orky Rich or something just to distinguish it between him and the other Rich. So I'm really looking forward to him joining us. He wasn't able to make it for the conversation that we'll be having. So uh, stay tuned to hear from him a little bit later. And for our second segment, I have a very special interview with our very own Warhammer hero, Mario Capizzo. Now, Mario is probably most well known for being one of the first generation of Warhammer heroes. And the reason for that was his involvement in the War Games for Warriors charity event which is a large fundraiser we've been doing in Utah for a few years now, where we are raising money for the Children's Miracle Network, for the Fisher House Foundation, which helps find housing for wounded veterans and their families. And we raise money to donate to these charities and play games of Warhammer while we're doing it. Now, the fundraising comes in a variety of ways. We'll talk about it a lot in the interview, which you will hear. And I have some very special announcements in terms of some of the prize support that we will be sponsoring on this show to give away as part of, well, giveaway may not be the right term for it. There is going to be a charity auction, and I have arranged for some very special prizes. And I would really like you to listen to the episode and listen for those prizes because there just might find something that you're interested in that you can get at this event, even if you aren't there in person. So with that in mind, let's get out of this very long intro and into the Librarius. Two, one. Welcome to the Librarius, everybody. I am here with Zach and Rich, and we're going to be talking about Crusade Gaming. Zach, Rich, introduce yourselves to all the listeners. My name's Rich, last name Mahoney. For Crusade, I'll be playing Necron, but my true love will, and always will be, uh, Tyranny. 
yeah, you know, he's in, I'm rich. My last name's Mahoney, something, something baloney. Like I was just waiting, waiting for you to bust, <laughs> bust a rhyme right there. He just had a, a beat to that. Well, that's the problem. Whenever we're at a tournament, since, you know, Kilton also lives here in the same area. And someone yells out rich, we both answer. So. Yeah. No, with, with a name like Chris, I have that same problem. I, I'm, I'm going to be calling Rich Kilton the Orky Rich just for the sake of everyone's sanity. Uh, he's he's not here today. Um, he's he's delivering the mail. He's the mailman. He delivers mail and sixes on his dice. That's that's <laughs> Orky Rich. Zach. I'm Zach. Uh, I'll be playing uh, Drew Kari. So I've been playing since fifth. Uh, so tell me about your years on Whose Line Was It Anyway? My years on Whose Line Was It Anyway? Drew Carey. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, couldn't resist. Ah, <laughs> uh, you even caught me. You, 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 you oh. caught him. Yes, I wasn't expecting a pun this early. Oh no, that is. Mm. <laughs> Do you know which show you're on right now? <laughs> um, well, I'm really glad that you guys joining me for for this segment talking about Crusade. And I'm actually really excited to play with you guys. We we met, gosh, at tournaments. Basically, we met through tournaments, didn't mm-hmm. we? Mm-hmm. For uh, pretty much exclusively, yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the interesting things, because like one of the things about this show that I wanted to build was like something that would, well, build slash break down kind of the walls between competitive, the like the stigmas of competitive and narrative play, mm-hmm. because really everybody's just kind of interested in fun. And I, I, I rarely met a narrative player who wasn't invested enough in their army that they just wanted they wanted to win with it and, and, and engage in that kind of a way. Um, it's a different kind of competition. But yeah, I, I, I remember the first time I played against Zach, you were playing, it was eighth edition. Yep. We were playing at Salt Lake Gaming Con. Mm-hmm. And gosh, I, I had built a, it was like my first list using eliminators, the primaries eliminators. And I had a, I also had a devastator squad, a blood angel devastator squad, which should tell you a lot about me. I, I painted it. I wanted to use it at least once. And we, <laughs> we, we had a, we had an interesting game. Uh, do you remember that game at all? You know, it's funny. I just remember you talking about their helmets. That's the only thing I remember from that yeah, game. Yeah, because they're blue, <laughs> dabba dee, dabba die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, it was not a decision I made. I've, I've actually made some some different hobby choices with my Blood Angel heavy support roll helmets, but we could talk about that another time. That was a fun game. I had just got come down from, I've been playing Chuck and his custodies, mm-hmm. and uh, he once again proved that I can make my opponent save as many four plus saves as possible and not make any of my own. <laughs> Oof. And then we, Rich, we met in Vegas. Yes. I think is what we were just talking about. Yeah, we were just, we were just kind of reminiscing. Yeah, the first time, uh, the first time I think I met you was our first trip to, to LVO, this was back when you could still buy LVO tickets. You know, a week before the <laughs> a week before the tournament. Yeah, and I think me and Zach, we just barely. This was this was the was, was, this, was the, this the first time we went? This was six. Yeah, this was the first time. This was about it, halfway it or the seven. tail end of six. That yeah, and seven. Yeah, I'm way, pretty sure. It w- yeah, it was the, six, yeah. seven. They were practically the same game. Hmm. Um, just more rules and more problems. Um, Hashtag Taudar. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Good old, good old allies. That that I don't miss that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So we were we decided finally to just jump full blown into competitive mm. uh, from just kind of playing uh, here in Salt Lake. Yeah. And so we were like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's go to LVO. Let's try their format because at the time I was completely against it. Uh, I was a firm believer in playing card point scoring system. Right. Not, yeah. Not the, running, oh gosh, what was that called? Maelstrom. Maelstrom, 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 yeah, Maelstrom of War. war. Oh, yeah. I, and we just, were, we I'm were, going into 40k PTSD right now. Right. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, we, were, we were both firm believers of it at the time, and every tournament we ran or went to was only Maelstrom. We just had no desire to do anything with the ITC, mm. and so finally we. We looked at it and we're like, well, they're growing. They're, they've got to be doing something right. And so we finally decided, okay, let's do it. Let's try it. We went to LVO. We we ran into, I think it was you who played Aaron. Yeah, I, I met uh, one of our local guys at Vegas. Yep. Never met him before. And I got paired <laughs> against him in round five? No, no, this it was, was day one. 
It was oh. like round two, round three. This is five. This is five. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Aaron Never five. met him before and ran into him at a tournament. Yeah. <laughs> and he and he was like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of guys from Utah here. This was yeah. So we were like, wait, what? Yeah. And then he he introduced us to 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 you to. We met uh, at that great Japanese restaurant. Yeah, over that's there. when that's when we got to sit down and actually just talk. Uh, right there outside of uh, Valley's, there's that uh, little ramen uh, Japanese place that has great curry too. Oh um, man! Yeah. yeah, we we went there. It was uh, it was all the Utah group. There was like twelve of us at the time, or you know something like that. The the poor the poor little Asian lady, she's like, how many? Uh, <laughs> that place is small. Uh, it is yeah, not. It is, it is tiny. Yeah, but uh, but it was a lot of fun. But yeah, so that was that's when we met everyone. That's when I met you, and. Uh, yeah, that, that was the start of us, of, uh, I think, the, the Utah group all getting getting a lot closer than how we than how it used to be. It's kind of funny, like, and that's, I think that's the thing that I like the most about tournaments. Now this, I know this is more of like, we're, when we're talking about Crusade, we're going to be talking about like more narrative stuff. But really, tournaments brought a lot of us together mm-hmm. in, in the community yeah. here in Utah. We've got, we've got a huge group of 40K players in Utah now. And it's really cool to see, like, you know, there was a, a a newbie tournament thing where it's just like an intro to tournaments that was done for mm-hmm. for new players only mm-hmm. as a way of teaching people and and really some of the best 40k friendships I've gotten in the state have come from either participating in or judging tournaments. I think that that's a, a great way to meet people in the hobby that you enjoy playing. And yeah, sometimes you're going to meet someone where you're just like. <sighs> Okay, gonna, gonna get me a nice drink and uh, I'm going to enjoy the next three hours as much as I can. But that is true. Like literally any hobby, anywhere you go, you could go grocery shopping and run into somebody like that. I mean, hopefully you're not spending three hours with them at the grocery store. But uh, that'd be a weird grocery shopping experience, all right. I mean, there's probably some some like husbands out there, just like their eyes got all dark, like in the background, like. I don't know, anime dark, de- like just, depression just, eyes, like just glazed, uh, uh, having like, target PTSD. <laughs> yeah. oh my God, right? Well, let's let's get into it. Let's talk about Crusade. Uh, I'm just going to do a little intro here to the idea and then we'll we'll get into it. So uh, Crusade Gaming is an attempt at the marriage between RPGs and tabletop gaming. To some extent, many players want to insert themselves into their faction and into their miniatures. Uh, while a large portion of the community loves to play narratively and enjoy their armies in a personalized way, it's a lot more work to make a narrative than it is to pick up a match play game with another player at the store at a tournament. So Crusade Gaming is an attempt to sort of bridge that gap by eliminating the need for the players to create their own campaign system and by giving them a system that's built into Warhammer, dedicated to a slow grow role play style of gaming, allows you to create legendary heroes, experienced veterans, and raw recruits. So... I think it's it's kind of funny that self-insertion is a thing that I always do in games I play, whether it's like RPGs, like, you know, think something like Dragon Age or or even even when I was playing like Dawn of War 2, right? And you're making the commander in Dawn of War 2 and I am picking the commander that fights in melee and has a jump pack and like and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm imagining myself as them. It reminds me of this thing. There's a survey done or not a survey, but they Baldur's Gate 3 took the most popular elements from all of its character creation data. The players said, you know, so all the players created a bunch of their unique characters or whatever. They took the most common features of every like hair or nose, ears, you know, skin or whatever race. And they, they plugged it in and it just looked like a normal guy. <laughs> and that's because there's a lot of normal people who just want to play in these fantasy worlds. And, and so Crusade is kind of like that. For the tabletop. No, I don't think I'd want to go into a 40k universe myself. <laughs> it depends. It depends on what role I get. Uh, you don't know my ex-wife. Yeah. It, it, a, lot, a lot depends on what role you get. If you're that grunt, if you're that frontline troop for, for you know, uh, it, the, the guard, no. No, this doesn't sound appetizing at all. Well, at least it'll be over soon. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> you're not wrong. You'll be food one way or the other. <laughs> Sometimes both ways, food in spirit and in body. Right. But yeah, I mean, I've I've always dreamed, and even when I was first getting into, like, I started playing Warhammer as a kid, and uh, the first model that was me that I created was this little. It was the old metal librarian. It was like a second edition model, and it was the way he was designed. He had. It was almost like if a space brain had dwarfism and had like <laughs> the had dwarfism and then had a little bit of Quasimodo because like 
the way that this sculpt came out, and it was one of those you know, pewter miniatures, uh, one of the shoulders was about like a half centimeter lower than the other one on a, on a straight, on, on, a, on, a, on a level torso. On so a, he looked like he was medius. kind of like hunched over doing, doing like, um, you know, if Quasimodo was James Bond in armor, um, that's kind of what my librarian looked like. And the paint job, honestly, probably suited that description. But um, <laughs> I, I wanted that librarian to be me. And I remember in the old codex, you could spend a lot of points to upgrade your characters. Like I, I gave him an adamantine mantle and I gave him an iron halo because you give librarians iron halos at the time. And I just went, do, 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 do. He had two wounds, mind you. This guy had two wounds and I, I, I burned something like 200 plus points on him wow. back in third edition, third, fourth edition, <laughs> trying to get him to be See, as, I, as cool as possible. I, I dodged all of that because my first army was Tyranid. We didn't do any kind of upgrading. The most we got to upgrade was, hey, do you have toxin sacks? So you so you gained a poison trait. OK, cool. Do you do you have adrenal glands? So you you run one inch faster. Cool. Oh, and, and here's your four different guns you get to choose from. That was our customizability. Outside of that, <laughs> it was paper, table, run at your opponent. Let's get it done. Well, all, all, all that you had to do was like uh, Doom of Malentai and Parasite of Mortrex. That was that was oh, that was tearing. Oh, the good old. The good old heroes, Parasite of Morthrax. Yeah. Nothing beat watching my opponents bring stuff in from reserves or get stuff out of transports, and then they had to roll to see if they died. Mm -hmm. And then I got to replace it with D6 river bases. Oh, yeah. it was so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my brother uh, grew up, I grew up with him playing Tyranids and he actually customized a lot of his because he would, he, he did that sort of gaunt upgrade thing where you could have the one gaunt that had synapse for the squad. Mm. So he put like a big warrior head on this tiny gaunt and it was, you know, it was like chibi, chibi warrior yeah. at, the, at the front. Of course, yeah. we didn't know what chibi was at the time, but that's, you know, so far as customizing units and, and building a narrative, like that's one of the things that competitive Warhammer you know, at least, you know, tournament Warhammer, match play Warhammer doesn't really let you do so much. I would say it's more common now than it used to be to have non-named characters in armies. Mm -hmm. but, I agree. Uh, and, you know, some people really like that. Some people don't. Being able to create something bespoke, something that's like, you know, yeah. what, this is my force. I think ninth, ninth edition probably does that better than any other edition before it. Like when you when you really get down and think about it, because what what books in the past have really ever allowed you to build a custom, like like a custom high fleet or a custom dynasty or a custom whatever cabal. you, yeah, yeah, cabal, that, that you know, yeah. whatever like, you whatever freaks are doing in the webway. Um, no, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of the things about Crusade that I really wanted to, to try and explore on the show is just that, that, that self-insertion ability and how it isn't just you're making this cool warlord who's progressing through stages and relics and getting all this other stuff. You're also making, you know, units that have stories and characters and, and you can, you know, the, the, the big ad for crusade right in the beginning of ninth was you could have a, a scout who turns into a Lieutenant who turns into a captain who turns into a dreadnought. Like you can, you can follow that perspective. I don't know what the, the Dark Elder equivalent of that is, you know, a slave that turns into a Talos that turns into a, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't think, I, I, I think a I'm Talos gonna... is the end of that progression. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just going to put that out there. I'm pretty sure Talos is the end of that progression. One of the troubles that I've had doing, I, I don't know if you guys have done a whole lot of like structured campaigns yet, is they usually, especially in Warhammer, like the GM wants to play. I built a campaign system at one point where I was the, where I was sort of the GM. I built the system. And I tried to build it so that it would run itself. So it would create a series of like trigger events that would that would cause a roll or something. And it was something that I didn't really have to arbitrate very much. But in the end, it was my first time doing it. I didn't really understand everything that would need arbitration. And it it quickly fell apart. Mm -hmm. um, and Crusade is trying to have a lot of those conversations for you by creating a system. You know, what what are some of the challenges of, of narrative campaigns that you guys can think of that you, that you've been interested in or that you've kind of the interest has died down or what were some of the reasons you could think of? Oh uh, well, we're going we're going. I'm going to go way back. I've never played this game with you. I used to play Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, and no, I've never, never yeah, had any desire. Me and my Not friends one. tried to create our own campaign, and it very quickly 
just got so bloated and over like we had too many things on the table. It just didn't work for that system. And mm-hmm. it just got to the point where it was unplayable. We'd be playing a single game for hours just trying to manage the rules that we created for ourselves. So mm-hmm. probably just bloat or okay. un- unanticipated growth and out of control. Yeah. Yeah. No, that I mean, that totally makes sense. W- one of the big ones for me is uh, commitment issues. Flaky gamers. I can see that. Yeah, because there was a there was a horse heresy campaign I started uh, about four or five years ago, and I had about sixteen people between twelve and sixteen people. It was an even number, and it was over ten show up for day one of the the campaign. And I had gone through the trouble of making a campaign map. I had the planetary empires tiles, which we'll be using for for our crusade. I had the planetary empires tiles and different space systems, and everybody had their own you know, factions and flags. And we played the game, and then. The second time I tried to get people together, we had five people show up. Wow. Yikes. And then yeah, it died. That's, that's that's a pretty heavy attrition. Usually you'll lose one or two. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know. So to answer the question of what I think the biggest problem, I, do, I haven't done a lot of narrative. I haven't done a lot of uh, campaign-based 40K. Mm-hmm. But I think anyone who, any of the players who are monolithic faction players or, you know, they, they branch out to maybe two. Like myself, I know Zach, he's been a Dark Eldar fan for ages. In your case, Blood Angels. In oh, Rich's yeah. case, Orcs. Mm-hmm. All of us, we, we, despite how bad our armies get at times, <laughs> <laughs> we, we all stick with those, those factions. And it's not because we are, well, in Zach's case, he might be a masochist. But uh, <laughs> it's not that we're all This masochists. is a family podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I we used, all suffer together. I, I used good <laughs> words, um, but uh, it, it, it's the fact that we we there's something in that lore, there's something in that 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 the history of that faction that just we fell in love with, and we just always want to play out. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, we all may be tournament players. We're we're not narrative players by nature because we enjoy the structure of tournament play. But even when you're playing that tournament game, I, I know, I know, me and Zach have played each other on a number at a number of majors without fail. We'll, we, we both do terrible. We end up at the bottom tables and we'll play each other like round six. That, that's me and Micah. Yeah, exactly. Much. Yeah, yeah. And and same with Rich. And it's the yeah. It doesn't like driving twelve hours to play your uh, regular sparring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no kidding. It's like I've been playing you for like fifteen years. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm so glad we took this 12 hour drive to play. <laughs> it's just in a different venue. It's so much better. Yeah. This, yeah. Is, this will change the game. Completely. The lighting just makes you look so much better <laughs> over here. Oh, uh, but, but even, even when we're, even when we're in those games and, and it's tournament focused, there's still, you'll, you'll notice that at certain points when certain things happen, you'll start to almost insert a narrative element to it. Mm-hmm. You'll, you know, you'll have that one, Jonah is another local player. Yeah. And he has one model that is the bane of my Necron's existence. And we refer to him as the White Knight. Ooh. And he uh it was a paladin model, wasn't painted, so just just gray, but it had it had kind of the the crosses on it and it didn't matter what I threw at it. Didn't matter what I shot it with, it would never ever fail its invulnerable save. <laughs> and so I, and I'm not joking. When I say I had at at one time in this game, we had three Doomsday Arcs, and I had shot all three at this one Paladin, and he would not go down. And it oh, was man, and that's so brilliant. And so we just started calling him the White Knight, and it was always the last one of the squad. It was always the last guy in the unit holding the objective, and he refused to just cut, just die. And so it just became this great little like narrative thing inside of a inside of a tournament game. And every time we've played since, it's always it, we always when it gets down to that one model, uh, we always look at each other, and it's it's become it's this the repeat. White yeah. it's, it's become this repeat thing. And I think that's probably the bigger challenge between for for narrative play versus match play. Match play, you can you create these narrative event or narrative. Uh, moments moments that's yeah. the word i couldn't think of uh these narrative moments that that get you really really into the game but when you're in that narrative setting it's there isn't that tournament focus i guess would probably be the best way mm-hmm. to put it and so 
for a lot of people, it sounds really fun. It sounds really good. And like what you were saying, you, you had that at that at that event, you had, you know, 16 people at the start. Mm -hmm. But unless they're they they get into that narrative mindset, unless they get into that 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 pull for their army, it's it's just going to be like a Friday night fun, you know, game to them. And it, it, they'll never look at it twice because mm -hmm. it's that there, there isn't that drive. Well, I mean, it, yeah, there's there has to be a, a kind of motivation to it. And I, and I think that's what like the crusade system tries to quantify is it's it's taking a stab at it. And I don't think it does everything perfectly, but I, I do really like it. I think it's the best the best thing that we have yet so far as creating a, a narrative structure that you could go almost anywhere and you could play a crusade game with someone the same way you could do your match play as long as you have your stuff together. Like the bookkeeping part of this is real. Like you have oh, to, yeah. it's like for, for all of you who are D and D familiar, which I mean, maybe not everybody is. I, I came into D and D backwards. I started working first. I know most people started D and Ding first and then were like, Oh, but what, what if armies instead of models like crusade basically gives you character sheets for every unit in your army and they level up and they do all that other stuff. Yeah. Sounds like a, uh... I have a hard enough keep, time to keeping track of my uh, one character. Your, your one character sheet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Zach and I are in a D and D uh, campaign right now where I'm DMing, and and on that topic of you know when you try to put a, a system together so it would self run, one thing I've learned is it never works because leave it to your players; they will derail it in the first chance they get. I've got mm -hmm. like the next five sessions planned, and I can already guarantee. Later today, when we have our session, I'm probably going to throw half, if not all of them, out the window. Yep. So, but yeah, I would never. No, never no, do anything <laughs> crazy in your campaign. I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> the so let's let's talk a little bit about then like the 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 structure with Crusade. So the the basic foundation is you start with an army. The army consists of 25 power level. I mean, there's a reason that GW is making all of its patrol boxes or whatever that, that have 25 power level models in there. I'm sure that some of that is for, you know, competitive, but I think the main reason is because they want people to be able to jump into crusade right away. Uh, I, I've, I have a feeling that crusade is the sort of thing that's happening. A lot of garage hammer out there that there's a lot mm -hmm. of people who are, you know, maybe not doing it at stores and, and we, and they're in locally, we do have some crusade leagues that are going on. So we know that people are coming out and playing it, but it just doesn't get as much attention. I mean, I, I don't know if it's ever been talked about on the Frontline Gaming Network before, but you start with a 25 power level force. And when you play games, you have resources that you can earn. This is, you know, this isn't the sort of StarCraft resource thing where you're getting minerals and Vespin. This is more like you are getting requisition and you're getting uh, reinforcement points and you're getting experience for your units. And those are the resources that you're spending between games to either grow your army or improve the capabilities of the units. Uh, and they have in, in the core rule book, they have basically a summary of this. And they have a bunch of the different tables and things that you can roll on. You know, this is the classroom setting. Everybody get your books out um, to, <laughs> uh, to if you have a unit that you want to spend the experience that it earns in the game, there are tables that you can roll on and battle traits. Yeah. They're, they're basically battle traits. And what what we what we've done with the crusade that we're starting is that we are uh, using armies that have codexes out already because it has the bespoke stuff in it because there's generic stuff in the core rulebook anybody can play crusade right now but if you want to really tell a story that's unique to your faction it's the crusade rules that are in the codex that are going to let you do that like you know use mine as an example one of the biggest things that had me excited about crusade pre ninth was the idea that Units can fall to the death company for my blood angels is that it and there is a, a set of rules in crusade something that doesn't happen in competitive play that if a certain if you if you have a unit that gets too many black rage tokens they turn death company like that unit changes and falls and that is cool like that that yeah I've got for those you know no one can see me right now but I got a big old grin on my face that's that just sounds fun. That makes me want my ninth edition nid book so much more. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean it, it's it's going to happen, right? And you're going to see it, and, and we can. Well, that's your true love. If you came in with your nids while we're still doing this initial campaign, and we're like, all right, I, I want to play nids now. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be pretty flexible with that. I mean, don't get me wrong. 
I love Necron. Necron are definitely my one of my favorite armies, but they are number two, unfortunately. And my true love will always be Tyranid, but no Crusade rules does make it a little hard to play the faction. Yeah, I started a Crusade with with Micah and his Tyranids. We started one together when I was living up north, and you know we we both kind of hit hit that wall at the beginning where it was just like, okay, well these are all kind of generic and. None of this is really bespoke yet. We don't know what we want to do for sure yet. And we played a game. I, I think we only played one game. I think we probably spent a half an hour playing the game and like four and a half hours talking because it was the first time we'd seen each other since COVID started or something. <laughs> but it was it, it was difficult because the thing that we were passionate about with our army wasn't there yet. And so that's why for it our crusade, missing. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I really wanted to play with you guys specifically, but I also knew that you had codexes out for your for your factions. Yeah. Well, and I can't wait to use uh, one of my witch cults. They have a rule where they can overdose on their drugs. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm so <laughs> something, I'm, something family show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's 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 content of purpose. It's all pez. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of pez. And just giving him, <laughs> just gotta give him crap. <laughs> no, it's it's actually funny. So he talks about that, but uh, I was when I was going through my Necron one. So I'm so as a tier player. I love the Horde. I love playing Horde. And so when I played, when I picked up Necrons, I played them the exact same way. I played mm. them Silver Tide, bodies upon bodies. And I was looking through the, the battle traits that I can add to a core unit. So my warriors, my immortals, my Lich Guard, I can make them auto pass reanimation rolls. Ooh. I can, I can, uh, every time they take a test, I can make it so one of those tests automatically becomes a six. So, I can, I can, a guy that would normally fail, it wouldn't stand back say, up. You're, you're, now you're dice, stand back you, up. You need that. Oh, yeah, guys. So, my so it's horrible. the Rich Kilton rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, but I get to put it on each of my units if I want. Ooh. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm steadily excited. I loved, I, when the ninth edition announcement video, where you just watch the Necron fall and stand up, fall and then stand up, it was, it was just, uh, it was speaking down. to me. Yes. <laughs> When I get up again, you're never going to keep me down. Oh, I'm not going to be able to unhear that every time you roll your reanimation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, should, I should just put it on my phone and just be like. Oh, man. Yeah, and, and that's that's one of the things that we never get to do in, in tournaments is we don't get to have that. We don't get to put that little character on it. And I really want to I really want to do that. I want to I want to see if the librarian gets killed and gets put into a librarian dreadnought. I want to see, you know, what. What, what happens? I, and I love the fact that there's risk that's baked into it because sometimes units could just straight up die. I mean, when, when a unit gets wiped out, it doesn't mean that it's permanently dead. You have to roll on a table and it could take injuries. But if it takes too many injuries, it could go away completely. And your characters do have a risk of dying permanently. So there is a little bit of risk. And I think that that also adds some engagement on the game, like on the gameplay side, because in a tournament, you spend your characters uh, to accomplish certain roles. Oh, it's chess. That's that's. Yeah. Whenever people ask me what 40k is, I explain it's complicated chess. That's that's all it is. You you take your five man squad of whatever you know warriors, immortals. You move them up the table to hold a spot. You, if they die, they die. You, there's nothing mm -hmm. lost because they've accomplished their goal. And you're always it's, trying to trade up. Yeah, uh, ideally. You know, yeah. You want to take the queen with your pawn. Yep. Uh, and and. With, with narrative, though, if you have a character who's wounded and maybe on the verge of dying, maybe you don't rush them up like you normally do until you can spend some of your requisition to rest them so that they can get better. That's part of the that's part of the fun of this for me is that maybe maybe your characters and units aren't expendable because if you've invested like this guy has this relic and has this thing and and you if you've burned a lot of resources into this character over a series of games, how how much are you really going to be willing to throw them out there, you know, and and just maybe lose it all? That's the same same thing with a D and D character, right? You you get up to level twelve, you're feeling really good, and all of a sudden the the beholder comes up and you are toast, you are disintegrated, or whatever it is. That character is gone. All that time, all that effort. It's yeah, yeah. Early, early games in in role players, it's real easy to to sacrifice things because you haven't lost a lot of time. But when you get to that higher level, you go, I don't necessarily want to do that now. <laughs> yeah. So that's 
that's kind of what what we're going to be starting here. And so we're we're still working on kind of the pre session zero stuff for our crusade. Uh, what I'm trying to do because I'm I'm organizing part of it is is we're we're building into it not just crusade, but we're also doing a multi system campaign. Now, a multi system campaign for people who aren't familiar with with that verbiage for it is we're going to be playing this campaign and telling a story using several different game systems. We're going to be incorporating fleet battles into the results of, of the different games that we play. There's going to be kill team. I, w- I would say we could try and incorporate stuff like Aeronautica and Imperialis, but there's not a lot of factions out for that yet. And that's honestly a lot of games to know how to play. Give me my Tyranid Flyers. <laughs> I want to play that, and I want to play the... What's the one for the Imperial Knights? Same. It's the same... Oh, sk- Titanicus? Yes, Titanicus. Yeah. Same thing. I want my Bio-Titan. Yeah, I yeah. want... Come on. Oh, me, I'm, why? I, I definitely want to play Titanicus with a wide variety of factions. I do love the Horus Heresy setting, but that's, hmm, that's a conversation for another episode. What's a Titan unit? <laughs> uh, sad dark Eldar noises. Sad dark Eldar noises. You know, I, I'm feeding off your grief the, the right big, now. The why, big, why don't dark Eldar have like all dark Eldar are Eldar that that instead of after the fall happened, instead of you know trying to redeem themselves, they just went. You know what? I'm not yeah, sorry. We're, we're, we're not. We're not sorry. We we're did not, this. We're not sorry. We're going to keep going. Why are there no Titans? There are Titans for Craft World. Why are there not spiky Titans for Dark Eldar? That's a good question. That, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I will, uh, I, I don't know, maybe maybe GW is just like, you know what? We've we've been stabbed enough picking up these models. I, I, <laughs> I mean, that's know. fair. That's, that is fair. So one of, the, one of the rule sets we'll be using is a space game system called, and try not to chuckle, Full Thrust. Um, Yep, I knew you'd fail. I knew you'd fail. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, okay, this rule says about as old as I am. So uh, I'm not going to say people back then didn't, didn't make this joke, but I was a kid and it's pure, okay? It's it's innocent. Full, full Thrust is an interesting space game system. It's pretty simple and it's something that I know a lot of people are like, well, why won't you play Battlefleet Gothic? It's like, well, one, Battlefleet, Battlefleet Gothic is a very old game that doesn't have rules or models support yeah it doesn't even have a modern rule set if i'm not mistaken it, it doesn't the people who do know how to play and who who do still have the stuff like it's it's one of those old complicated games like it as as game battle tech yeah like there there are there's some real nuance to it and i i'm not saying it's not fun but i'm trying to to do something that's a little bit simpler to keep up with and full thrust rules are available for free online so it's it's an easy, accessible space combat game that we'll will be making ships for. Right now, I'm actually painting up. I uh, I've got a a printed version of a unique ship from the Battlefleet Gothic video game that I'm painting up for my capital ship, and then I'll be getting some ships for for these guys. Orky Rich has his own orc Battlefleet Gothic fleet because of course he does. Uh, he has. He has his own fleet, so I'll be getting some ships printed off with you. And what we're going to be doing with the campaign system is there are three different planets in the system, and each planet has its own kind of bespoke bonus so far as the campaign is concerned. And these are all very light and will have minimal impact on our 40K games per se. But I want I want the map to have meaning because we're using the planetary empires to represent these different planets. Mm-hmm. I want the map to have meaning. So if you have... A feature of this map like one of them for example has uh, a moon base so there's a moon orbiting this planet and it has a moon base if you have control of the moon base it's going to give you a benefit in fleet battles you're going to get an extra destroyer for free and the destroyer is a small ship it's a small benefit but every little bit helps so there's yeah that's the so there's the Veda system Adveda is the name of the moon and the player who controls Adveda may deploy one additional destroyer and fleet battle missions. And then there's Vidalia, which is an agricultural planet. Because agri- agriculture resources, natural resources, if you control three or more tiles of this planet, then you get an additional requisition point each each game round. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a benefit that's, that comes from from having it. Yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. Yeah. And then Akromoda, the, the capital, has orbital platforms. 
and they represent a key defensive advantage in the region. Players who own both tiles of the orbital platform get the first turn as defenders in battles that occur within their system. And, you know, so that, huh. but that's, so that's a really strong benefit, that but it's, sense. but it's very local to that planet only. Uh, now, some of the things Intrigued. that these extra, what I'm building into this multi-system campaign is if you play a kill team game and you, and you are attacking Akromoda, they own the orbital defense platform. If you win the kill team game, you can spend your, it's, it's basically you earn a token for winning a, a support game. You can spend that token to get rid of the advantage for a player on the next round. So if you, you know, are, are engaging in kill team, you want to attack Akromoda, you're worried about going, uh, you're worried about going second because first turn is, is really powerful. You can use a kill team to sabotage the benefit. And and even that out so that when you when you go in and you attack and you try and take one of these tiles of the orbital platform away, it doesn't go according to plan. Exactly. And so these these little things are going are going to have effects on the game. Uh, and that's what I'm building into this campaign system. What do you guys think about that? Does that sound fun? Does that sound interesting? Does it add strategy or is it just it, tedious? I, I'm already thinking about. No, it, it definitely it definitely adds strategy and it's very interesting because I can guarantee that because as you brought up a couple of different things, both of us, we, we stopped talking and we've been sitting here I mean, <laughs> listening to you. Don't get me wrong, but we've been both sitting here kind of looking at each other and just kind of letting our minds wander off into strategy. <laughs> and so we've already started going, oh, if that if I could do that and I could do like it's just. And, and maybe that's part of just the, the gamer mentality or the tournament mind. And it's just the, ooh, okay, what can I, how can I make this better? Like, for example, just the, the agriculture planet, that, it, that one additional requisition point is the difference of, you know, five power level. That's mm -hmm. one of the things you can spend that, that requisition point on. So in our game, instead of it being 25 power on 25 power, it's 25 on 30. I mean, how often, you know, I mean, even if that five, that five power level is just five more models, just as an example, yeah. Yeah, a horrible yeah. example, but we'll just use it. Um, no, it's it, it's a hundred points. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even, even if it is just another five models, that's, that's, a, that's five more models than my opponent has. That's, that's five more chances for dice not to, to yeah. completely yeah. bone me. Um, there's, there's leave, leave it to the mid player to want to just bring more models. <laughs> I already said I play Great Tide. I, everyone who knows me knows this. I love Horde. It's Horde. it's one of the reasons me and Rich have such enjoyable games because he plays Horde. And so you're looking at a table that has 600 models on it, and we still get done in three hours because we're just throwing this into this melee cacophony mm -hmm. in the middle, and it's great. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I want to come out of this is because we we are conditioned enough as gamers to want to strategize and to want to play and i'm just trying to create a a macro that fits in with a micro but not in a necessarily totally game breaking way sure but it gives by having these different planets offer these different benefits it gives you a reason to go out and try and stop somebody from getting theirs and then by having these benefits perhaps sabotaged by some of these support games, it gives you a reason to want to play these other games as well. And so I'm still, I would say I'm about halfway through the, the building of this campaign system. And again, I'm trying to make it so that it just kind of runs, but because I'm making it simple, I mean, the, the last one that I did, for example, I created about 12 different custom tables for different traits and possibilities. And there was a huge map and it was just, it was, it was way too big for my britches, but this should be manageable with, and it had more people as well. So this, this will be just the four of us. Okay. And we'll be testing this stuff out kind of as we go and we can talk about it and we can adjust things. Cause I'm not, I'm not married to everything. The first draft of something is never always hundred percent right. But the, the idea being that we are hopefully we can create a system that not only works for us, but if people are interested in using a similar system for a multi-system campaign at home, they can do that as well. And Crusade is kind of wrapped up in that idea that we are going to create a story 
And the story is going to be focused around our armies and our characters. But that story is going to take place on land, in space, and in, in the densely packed corridors and city streets of, of this, uh, I call it the diadem stars, is the system we're going to be fighting over. So what do you guys think? Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm pretty stoked. See, and he's thinking about, I want more models. I want more models. I'm sitting here going, I can't wait to send the squad of Dark Eldar onto this Imperium world and just kill things. <laughs> just mess with stuff. Just, yeah. just sneak in and be... I, I'm still trying to get my mind off of Tyranid looking at it from for this. Just like, oh, look, I, I ate this whole planet. Now I have all these extra options. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta keep, I gotta think about it in the aspect of Necron. You're all on my planet. <laughs> get off my lawn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> old old man Necron here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe that will be that maybe that will be the warlord. So before before we wrap up, I want to I want each of us to kind of pull up our crusade rules and just talk about the thing that we're most excited about so far as the character we want to create and who you're thinking you want to be the leader of your of your force here. So I'll, I'll start with mine. Uh, now, I've already talked about how cool sort of the, the death company mechanic is. The There's a bunch of cool crusade relics for Blood Angels, and I'm, I'm very interested in using those. But I think the thing that I, I'm most interested in, in doing with my character is using an honorific. Now, the honorific is basically a, it's, it's like your calling card. It's the thing that your strategy is, is famous for. So, for example, one of them is Shield of Ball. And game-wise, what that means is once per battle, if this unit is on the battlefield, you can use one of the battle tactic stratagems twice during the same phase instead of only once. So it's it's a title that your character has that gives you a benefit in the game. But you know, if I want to create, you know, Captain Azathel, the Shield of Ball, then that's kind of what I want to create, is I want to create sort of an iconic character who builds this strategy that he becomes famous for and it becomes a part of his part of his story. So what about you guys? So uh, for mine, I think uh, one thing, the so the color scheme that I chose for my army, I based it off of an actual lore cabal that's kind of obscure, mm -hmm. but it's about this Archon that basically got uh, banished from the Dark City. So he's fully space bound and he's trying to work his way back in. And part of the crusade rules for Dark Eldar is you're gaining territory back in Kamora, the dark city. Okay. So I'm kind of like oh, that's cool. one to him to come back to power and get back into the city. That's kind of what I'm thinking for his. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a Peaky Blinders. Yeah. You're, you're cutting your way back into the underworld. Exactly. Sort of a, very cool. Yeah. The other, the other thing, not, not totally game changing, but uh, I had the option to give my Archon combat drugs, hmm. which I'm just stoked to try out. How about, how about you, Rich? So for mine, one of the, so for the, for those of you, Everyone, those of the listeners who are familiar, Necron are, you know, just robot Egyptians. The easiest, easiest <laughs> explanation. Robot Egyptian Terminators. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, so something interesting is, for us, is the uh, dynastic uh, antithesis. And so every time my, my, if I'm not using a named character, which I have no intention of doing, every time we get a, a victory, I get to add one of these, these titles or additional long names you know th think lord of the rings were or uh you know any of the fantasy game you know, books or stories where they're like this is lord oberon of house shinoa of you know blah 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 blah. <laughs> the spoiler yeah. of the blah 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 yeah yeah, yeah. All, the thousands of titles yeah so the necrons have something like that embedded into their for their characters and it's every third title i gain i then get to add another ability to them because he's just become that much cooler. Uh, uh, yeah, that's so, fun. That's so, fun. so every victory I get to roll on this table to 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 add these these titles. So you know, uh, Grand Sunderer, Doom of Morigar, King of the Crimson Rising. You know, I get uh, I get to make my character's name its own character sheet because it's great. just so amusing <laughs> and, and so to me it's it's that that pre-game thing of when you're introducing your your army to your opponent like and this 
This here is the the overlord of my dynasty, king of. I, mean, I, yeah. can, I can spend five minutes pregame giving him all of his accolades. Very cool. Just just for amusements. I'm I'm going to demand that you do that before every game. I I have every intention of doing that. That is he, fantastic. He who spits upon the ancient codices. <laughs> <laughs> like I have, how many are there on this table? It is uh. Six. Is it? I don't know. You count faster than I do. I, mean, I just got to do this the hard well, way. Well, it's it's, <laughs> it's D66 table, so it, yeah, it's two D66 table. Gotcha. So it's it's pretty. So basically, like it, you, it's, you're going to be able to have a lot of fun with it. Oh yeah, oh, it, yeah. It, it, this is going to be great. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, guys, uh, this has been a great chat. I'm I'm really excited to get started with this. Obviously, it's going to take some time to prepare. I think before, like when we do session zero, what I'd like us to do before then is have you guys build your 25 power level forces. I'll build mine. Uh, Rich should have a copy of his Orb Codex and I'll get him started doing that. He's an experienced DM and and he should be able to, to more or less put that sort of stuff together. I'm what I what I'm going to try to work on because I, I do some graphic design. So I'm going to I'm going to try to build some PDF editable PDF sheets that would make digitally tracking stuff a little bit easier. Uh, but in the meantime, we can scan the the sheets out of the basic rule book and we can just use you know paper and pencil to keep track of our units. Let's try and have all of that, uh, that yes, sort of classic. bookkeeping stuff done. The next time we meet and talk about our crusade, we'll kind of go over the, the final build of the campaign, make sure everybody gives it the thumbs up to get started, and then we can start playing games. And I have... I have some terrain that's being built that I'm very excited about that we'll we'll be able to use as well. Um, that's less competitively designed. Um, well, it has some less competitively designed elements, some really really big centerpieces and, and things that you know. With a competitive table, you're more worried about a balanced table, but with a, a narrative, you can have something interesting and unique there. So. I'll keep you guys posted on that. And then on my uh, Captain Morgan's Librarius Facebook page, I'll put up some progress pics on some of the fleets and some of the terrain and all that other stuff. And hopefully we'll be able to incorporate some game footage. And uh, if I can get my setup working well enough by then, we'll be able to have conversations with video where we'll be able to talk to each other uh, and people will be able to see us talking to each other. So that's kind no, of... I don't know if I want that. <laughs> you get what you pay for. Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you guys so much for joining me to talk about this, this segment. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I hope you are too. And uh, we'll, we'll check in again maybe next month. If we're more excited, we can go faster and, and get, get going faster. But our next segment, I'll be interviewing Mario Capizzo, our very own Warhammer hero, about the War Games for Warrior, Warriors charity event. Are you guys going to that? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. we're yep. signed up. Yeah, I'm trying to decide whether I want to bring a joke army or a real army. A joke army being like a Thunderhawk. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> like, spend 800 points on a model that your Dark Hitler can shoot off the table in half a turn. Not his, uh, not not his no, Dark Not Hitler. the way I play Dark Not Hitler. the way he plays. Yeah. They would actually do work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I would see. actually struggle with that the way, I, the way my list is right now. Well, I would bad touch it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's an 800 point vehicle model. It everything bad touches it. Las guns bad touch it. How how many wounds does it have? Uh, gosh, thirty. Oh no. Okay, it would take at least two turns. Yeah, you're fine. I don't know about that. We'll see. Anyway, I, I, so I, it'll either be that consistently doesn't doesn't do more than three wounds when I roll. <laughs> uh, well, you you haven't rolled them against me yet. I'll just say that. Well, thank you guys, and we will uh, we'll check back in again next time. Sounds good. Thanks. Right on. Hey, tough luck tonight, buddy. Yeah, tough new hotness, more like it. <laughs> sure, pal. Same time next week? Sure. See ya. <sighs> what am I gonna do about the new hotness? Amanda, we need to talk. Ah, Kato Sicarius. No, it is I, 
Robute Gillivan, and we need to talk about your performance tonight. Aw, oh, come on, Robute. He's playing the new hotness. What can I do? Well, the Codex says to use the terrain to your advantage, not leaving your whole army set up in the open. But, Robute, the best I can do is this packing styrofoam that came with my dad's TV. Heresy! You can do better than that. Buy some MDF terrain from Frontline Gaming. Frontline Gaming? Isn't that that company run by the guy who sounds like he has strep throat all the time? Hey, bro, not cool. Silence! Don't get distracted. This is how you forgot to bring in your reserves. But, Robute, I don't even know what MDF means. It's woodcut with las guns or something. It's not important. It's quality, durable terrain made for all modes of play with different themes like desert, ruined city, industrial, aliens, and more. But I hate painting terrain. It's boring. Never fear. Frontline Gaming has painting services as well. You're right, Lord Gilliman. I should order some. But how do I do that? Where do I start? Go to www. FrontlineGaming.org to find out more about terrain, miniatures, painting services, hobby articles, and events. Gee, thanks, Robute. Any more advice for your loyal force commander? Not now, commander. I have to go back and check on Marnius. Last time I was gone this long, the 500 worlds became the 375. Go ahead and check out www.FrontlineGaming.org. Tell them the Chief Librarian sent you. Hey everybody, welcome to a very special segment of the Chief Librarian. I am here with Warhammer hero, Mario Capizzo. How you doing, Mario? I'm good, thanks for having me. Dude, I'm so excited to be talking to you. We have a, a really cool set of announcements that are going to be at the end of this interview, but mostly we're going to be talking about his charity event, War Games for Warriors. Tell me a little bit about the event, Mario. So War Games for Warriors was started back in, uh, I want to say, 2016. COVID kind of threw a wrench in it, so I, I don't know if last year counted. But So 2016, it was kind of the brainchild of Ben Gabbert, who is another member of the community here. And we just kind of ran with it. Um, it was a it was a little bit smaller that first year. We decided to try and do a GT. We successfully managed to do and it was a one day GT and we will never do that again. The community <laughs> made it very clear to me that five rounds in one setting is not acceptable nor possible for anyone over the age of 16. <laughs> so we will not do that again. But the whole purpose of War Games for Warriors is we have a originally it was just 40K. It has branched out. We've done Sigmar, War Machine and Hordes, Infinity it's just whatever we can kind of get communities to volunteer for. But the whole purpose behind it is, is we raise money for two charities. One of them is Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And we do that under Extra Life, kind of their game that they do every year. Um, and we raise money for the Salt Lake City Fisher House, which is a hotel slash home on many VA hospital campuses that provides lodging um, free of charge to veterans and service members receiving care at the VA facility for their families. So their families are able to be on site with them so that they don't have to buy a hotel out in the city out of pocket especially when you have these people that get like heart surgery and stuff, you might be talking about a couple of weeks um, and it's just not really anything any one family can normally afford. So the whole purpose is we raise funds for those two charities. The first year, I think we raised about $3,000. The second year we raised about five or $6,000 and we are on track to beat that this year. I don't want to jinx myself and say where we're at, but we are on track to beat that this year. 
So what, uh, what inspired you to do those charities in particular? So Children's Miracle Network is, that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, I have several friends that have small children that have received care at Children's Miracle Network hospitals. And for those of you that may not know what Children's Miracle Network hospitals are, is if you fall under that umbrella of one of those hospitals, they provide care to children regardless of a family's ability to pay. So, and they provide life-saving specialty care. For example, here in Utah, if it is a more severe pediatric case, all children go to its primary children's in Salt Lake. So because I have several friends whose children have been in that situation, I kind of have a personal connection to making sure that those kids get taken care of. And yeah. Uh, And then Fisher House is just, that's relevant to me. I was in the army for nine years. I have a lot of friends that are veterans. Fortunately, I've never had to use Fisher House or its services, but it's a way that I can kind of give back to those who are still serving or have gotten out and maybe weren't as fortunate as I am and have continual needs that they need care for after their military service. So we tried to pick charities that were local. That was the focus behind Fisher House, Salt Lake City and Extra Life. Now that we're getting, we're growing, um, it might need to be like more of a national effort. I don't know. I mean, that's something we'll have to look at. It's kind of a growing pain of the event, but it's a good growing pain to have. Yeah, I would say so. No, I I remember I I was at uh, I was at that first one where we did that five rounds in one day, and my my girlfriend at the time agreed to come and watch me play. And it was basically I'll go until my first loss, and then we'll go out to dinner. And I ended up getting to round five, <laughs> fighting Rich Gilton for for first place on that one. Um, that didn't turn into a great date night, but it was a very, very fun event, I will say. And I think that, you know, wh- one of the things that I that I appreciate about Fisher House the most as as someone who you know, my my grandpa was a World War II veteran. He had to use the VA hospital quite a bit. Anything that can help those guys out matters. It, it matters to me personally with with that sort of military family connection. And then being a dad myself and having the great fortune of my my children haven't ever had to go to primary children's for a big thing, but I have had to take my kids to the ER and I have had to pay those bills. And I know that it can be daunting to have to deal with that. So I really, I really appreciate the work that this charity does. And I'm really happy that we have this affiliation within our hobby and it's become kind of a, a staple event for Utah. Now you, you mentioned you have that military connection for Fisher house, but how did you get started with Warhammer? So like all young Warhammer addicts, I was introduced at a young age by another member of the community. I I was in seventh grade. So way back in 2001. Oh, man. So we're coming up on 20 years. So way back in 2001, we had a, a history instructor at my at my junior high who he played Warhammer and he said, hey, well, let's start a gaming club. It really was the Warhammer club because we didn't play anything but Warhammer, but <laughs> whatever. And we played our first couple of games on uh, he brought some of his models in and we played our first couple of games on those I'm trying to think those little picnic tables that they're they're made out of metal and they've kind of got that pa- plastic spray coating on them. But oh, they're uneven. Yeah. yeah, I know. what you're uh, talking about. So you're trying to move, trying to move little this is way back in third edition. So um, you're trying to move little plastic guys on 25 mil bases. They're all falling over. And Oh yeah. Um, it, but you know, it was a great time. I was hooked. I thought, I thought Imperial guard was just kind of the coolest thing ever because the whole Warhammer setting is you've got 40,000 years in the future. Everybody's got all these high tech space lasers and power armors and, blessings from dark gods or whatever it might be and then you got a guardsman who gets a piece of cardboard and a flashlight and is told we'll go fight all that stuff so it really kind of appealed to me and to this day (laughs) one of the things i love the most about warhammer is the lore so it can get kind of frustrating that the lore doesn't really ever seem to progress but i definitely love the more the lore more than even probably the game itself so if you're a guard fan, do you like the Caiaphas Kane books? Do you like the the Gaunt's ghost stories? Like what are your favorite books and stories? 
So I have to admit, I've never read any of the Kane books and I haven't read. I don't think I've read any of Gaunt's Ghosts. I have all of Gaunt's Ghosts. I have the entire series. It's just in my backlog of things to read. The guard books I did read that I really enjoyed was the Last Chancer series. I just thought that was really cool. It was a, it was a penal legion and they kind of... They were like the well, and it wasn't even a legion. It was just kind of like a special unit. And they went and grabbed these these criminals that were basically in in jail for life or or were gonna get the death penalty. And they said, Hey, come finish this awesome mission. And if you live, you get your freedom. So honestly, my absolute favorite book is Devastation of Ball by Guy Haley. I know that there's a lot of people who disagree with me on this, but I actually I love that book. I think it is extremely well written i like that it kind of shows a a human side of space marines that you don't normally see in um, warhammer novels they're normally kind of they don't have emotion they're very monotone very for the emperor there's no deviation they don't ever they don't get tired they don't get sick and in devastation of ball towards the end you get to see dante actually kind of express some of those human feelings of tiredness and kind of exhaustion which is probably normal when you're over 1500 years old so that seems reasonable my international reputation as a hopeless fanboy of the blood angels notwithstanding i also really like that journey that you get to go on with dante that starts in the book named after him also by guy haley and then continues on here where you kind of get the the sense of you know i I probably wasn't meant to to live this long. I know most of most of the critics of Devastation of Ball are critical of two things. The first thing and probably the biggest thing is the ending. A lot of people just really didn't like the Deus Ex Machina of Gilliman showing up. However, on that note, that was something that I don't think Guy Haley had any control over because that got written into just the basic rules and, and the codex by somebody else. And it was just something that had to happen. I don't feel like the rest of the story is diminished by that very much, personally, because I enjoyed the ride. The The other thing that a lot of people that I've seen online kind of complain about was the sort of pomp and ceremony, the non-combat times, the council meetings and the discussions and the theorizing over the nature of the hive mind and all that kind of stuff. And me, as a lore junkie, I just soak that all up. I love that. I want to put it in quotes and type it in articles, and I want to analyze it and pick it apart and dissect it. but a lot of people are more interested, I guess, in the action, and they don't really care as much for that aspect of the storytelling, that that kind of world building thing. But I have to agree that that's certainly one of my favorites. the The new Blood Angels lore certainly strikes a strikes a chord with me. Now, you have uh, so far as miniatures, I know that you you at least had a big army of guard, and you've got some Blood Angels, right? So I don't have my guard anymore, which. Like everybody who lets go of an army. Some days I regret it. Some days I'm fine with it. I have an extremely sizable Blood Angels army now. Probably getting close to six or 7,000 points. I have a bunch of vehicles I've acquired for it. Uh, I have a bunch of characters. I mean, I before Primaris were even a thing, I probably had about two battle companies worth of Marines. And it's just grown since then. I can relate. <laughs> right but just on a quick note just going back to the the lore that we were talking about if we've learned anything as community organizers you're never ever going to make everybody happy so i actually love that because they talk about how space marines while they're warriors and generals they're also supposed to be statesmen and i mean you do have these kind of examples of how kind of each chapter really personifies um, an aspect of being a space Marine. You still kind of have this situation where they still, I mean, blood angels are very, very proud of their heritage. I mean, if they're not proud of their heritage, why in the world do they have the black rage? So, and, and I get it's, it's a psychic imprint on their bloodline. But I mean, if you would think a chapter that is haunted by something that happened during the Horus heresy, why would they not focus on anything else? They're very concerned with um, kind of remembering their heroes, paying honor to heroes. So, but yes, sorry to get back to your question. Um, <laughs> my blood angels army has grown very sizably to the point that I'm, I'm thinking about starting to play Horus Heresy because I have enough Marines to do now. 
So that might be an option uh, here in the next couple of months. Um, we should team up then. Yeah. Between between the two of our forces, I think that we could build a, a nice campaign somewhere. There there are uh, quite a few Horus Heresy players that show up at one of the local stores here on, on Friday nights. It's been a while since I've been able to make it over there, but it would be fun to get out and play some more Horus Heresy. I actually need to, to field my Sanguinius. I've... I've mostly used my Sanguinius uh, 30k model as the Sanguinor in 40k with the uh, with the approval of my TOs. So that has made me sad that I've used Sanguinius more after he's died than when he was still alive. But say la vie, I, I'm just going to have to live with that uh, or he will just have to stay not lived with that. Uh, well, speaking of community organization, now how did you get involved in the local community here and how did you start kind of getting involved with running events and things so it kind of happened kind of happened by accident i started working at a local store that was here just kind of part-time and that's what initially got me back into warhammer and i'm i'm not one of those people that can just kind of sit by idly when i see that something needs to be done um, so I saw that at the time when I came into the community, there was kind of a lull. There wasn't a real heavy push among community organizers for 40K. I think it was shortly after you had kind of taken a step back from the scene here in Utah. And I just kind of started from there. And we started running events at, at Endzone, that store in Clearfield. And it kind of grew from there. And I've just kind of, as things have progressed, I've I've tried to grow things out. I'm not at end zone anymore, but I mean, the community is growing, especially I think COVID actually contributed to it. We've kind of seen a explosion now that lockdowns are, are going away is that people are really eager to get out and play. Whereas to, as before we had opportunities to play, but people were like, ah, I might go. I mean, it's not a big deal if I make it out or not, but now people are, they're eager to get out and play we were just able utah just recently was able to hold its first itc major a couple of months ago and that was organized by a newer team here in the state called lightly salted there are actually some really nice guys that they absorbed my team and by virtue of that i got to join their team i try i'm also the utah itc rep so i try really hard to remain impartial so I don't really refer to myself and lightly salted together very often. Not that I'm not super proud to be a part of the team, but I feel like I need to remain impartial and fair as the rep. But they they put in a tremendous amount of effort and were able to pull off that major. I and mean, that was kind of the culmination of several years worth of groundwork that's already been addressed. Lou Rollins mentioned it in his article pretty extensively talking about this, the work that the rudder had done in the past. You yourself... Chris and uh, Alan with Gladiator Games. So it was just kind of a culmination of all of that rose into us being able to finally pull off a major. And now we're looking at having our second major. I mean, we're already there. I have enough tickets sold for uh, War Games for Warriors that were definitely a major. So to go from having barely having to fight and I mean, you've been there. We've had these conversations late at night about, man, we're going to have to pull like three or four ringers to try and have a gt like i just i don't know how many drops i'm gonna have in the morning all the way up to we're now comfortably gonna have two majors in the same year is just kind of a really big achievement for the community as a whole and i'm excited to see it continue to grow the biggest problem we're running into now is terrain space toppers stuff like that so that stuff can be worked out the hardest part is getting the people to come i would say and we're finally getting to a point where people are eager to come out and play so we just got to find bigger stuff maybe one day we'll hold an event at the uh one of the colleges or something take up one of their stadiums i would love to see us have a, <laughs> a super major one day but i can promise you i won't be running that i don't want that kind of stress <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you, you covered a lot of ground there and i i have to just kind of echo how proud i am of the local community here in coming as far as they as they have you said you got involved shortly after i kind of moved on to doing more of the itc stuff where i was judging LVO and getting more involved internationally and and doing the some more of the the back end support for the ITC and frontline. When I first started trying to do tournaments, I remember the very first Gladiator Games, I was an attendee. I was not an organizer. 
when we went there, I think we had like 13 people, maybe 14 people, you know, at this advertised as a GT and the 40 K person didn't, uh, didn't want to participate in the next year. And so they put out a call in the community and here, here I was, that was my biggest Warhammer tournament gaming experience. And I just kind of raised my hand and said, I guess I'll help out. And <laughs> that's, that's how I got started with organized play. And, and after a couple of years and some very hard work, I mean, my, my very first like RTT that I judged in support of the, the GT was six people. Like there were six people at the first RTT I, I judged. And this is getting close to eight or nine years ago, maybe, maybe even longer. And by the time two years had passed, we, we've had Utah's first GT at Salt City Gladiator Games. And that was that I felt like that was huge. And then I got to actually go and play at the major that Light, Lightly Salted did. And that was humbling in a sense to kind of see like, look, look at the way that people have picked up the torch. And I felt the same way about the work that, that you and Ben did, you know, taking over Gladiator Games for me before that entire convention kind of split apart into its own component pieces of the different game systems. But really, more than anything else, I'm really proud of this community. And War Games for Warriors is a big is a big part of that beyond, you know, beyond just the simple enjoyment of it. And it's a tremendous amount of work. Everybody who's listening really should air pat Mario on the back here for trying to herd all of the cats, you know, all of the gamer cats and then run down, you know, people to donate their their time and their talents for the different ways that we're raising money for this event uh, on that note mario what are some of the things like what are some of the prizes how are some of the different ways that you raise money in war games for warriors so it comes from uh we have kind of a multitude of ways we have we have raffle prizes so one of the things that we're raffling this year we have an indomitus box so people will be able to buy raffle tickets to that we in the past and it's kind of it's been a growing pain in the lessons learned thing but in the past we kind of tried to do a lot of stuff through auctions and we raised money that way but we've kind of we've learned what to put at an auction as opposed to what to kind of raffle. An example would be lightly salted at their major had a raffle for Curse City and it was $5 a ticket or five tickets for 20 bucks. And that all of that money went to a local animal shelter charity and they raised like $600 doing that. Well, nobody's going to pay six. I mean, don't get me wrong. Curse City's the in demand wanted item. Nobody's dropping six hundred dollars on Curse City. So had they auctioned that item, they probably would not have raised near as much money. Um, and that's something that we had to learn with War Games for Warriors: is what goes to the auction, what goes to the raffle. Because if you win, you win Curse City, and you, I mean, say you bought fifty dollars in raffle tickets, you got a two hundred dollar game for fifty bucks. It's a screaming deal, and it all goes to a good cause. So we've got an Indominus box. That's that's going to get raffled. Uh, I know you're going to mention them here in a little bit, but we've had several different authors from the Black Library that you have provided. They've provided the novels are going to be autographed and available for auction and or raffle. We'll have to work out what's going to wear. There's there. the big reveal, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to steal his thunder. I guess Ooh. I really didn't because you guys you guys still don't know what books there are, but uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Chris has graciously oh, shush. put in the legwork to get us some some stuff that I, I think is going to be extremely popular among the community. I'm actually pulling up the list right now of what the prize support we have. And, and that's something, if you're listening and you're coming to the event, I love you guys. Thank you for coming out. Just keep in mind that this is a charity event. So prizes for the event are going to be, they'll be random. You're not going to get, I mean, we will have like trophies and stuff for first place best general renaissance man best painted etc but you're not going to go home with a bunch of a trade credit or model kits and stuff like you normally would i mean we'll make sure you get your recognition and stuff but the focus of the event is to get people there or is to raise as much money for the charities as possible so let's see we've got a bunch of random warhammer kits that are being donated by a local store paragon city games is doing that blackfire games another local store is they're donating several tables and toppers so that we can carry out the event let's see we've got some blight haulers there's 
several start collecting boxes and or combat patrols. There is a really awesome five-man unit of assault intercessors. So a local community member kitbashed a bunch of assault intercessors, and he crossed them between orcs and uh, the new intercessor kits, and I think they look amazing. Um, so you, you didn't say it wrong. You said intercessors. Correct. All right. Correct. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, on board. <laughs> there's there's a Catachin Colonel that's going to be available for auction. That's painted by Lou Rollins. Um, there's several different commission services that have been donated by local commission artists, ranging from everything from like a infantry to a hero size character all the way up to i think a, a riptide is as large well riptide size base and then the really big one um this has already been determined but a local commission artist agreed to build and paint a warbringer nemesis titan for Jeez. another local community member and he is donating the proceeds from that build and paint job to fisher house Wow. So that's really cool. They've already, yeah, they've already come to that agreement. They set a price and then the commission painter and the person looking for the commission agreed that all of that money would go to Fisher house. I'm not going to mention dollar amounts. It's pretty sizable. It'll get included when we announce at the end of the event, what our total amount raised is, but yeah. So the, Ooh, there's going to be some of the new black library, Horace Lupercal bookends available. There's going to be a brand new Dante Darkness in the Blood Collector's Edition set available. For those of you that are Blood Angels fans, you know that that is absolutely beautiful. If you weren't able to get one, now's your chance. And we're also going to have some custom-made objective markers. We're doing that in partnership with 3D6 Wargaming. Jordan Gledhill, one of our local players, helped me design those. He, I basically gave him some ideas of what I kind of wanted it to look like, and he ran with it and did the hard part of doing the art because let's be honest, everybody has ideas, but <laughs> it's a little bit harder when it comes, comes time to put pen to paper. Yeah. Ideas um, and talents are, are not necessarily married. We'll put it that way. Exactly. And that, and, and I do want on a quick note, and it's like you were saying, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to pull off these events. And this event, a big reason that War Games for Warriors is going to be a major this year and is so successful is because of the contributions of several local stores, several local teams, and even more so individuals. There are just, there are, the, so every single table at War Games for Warriors is donated, well, not donated, but it's going to be provided by a store or a local community member. There is no one person that controls all of this terrain or these tables or their toppers. It's very much so a collection of effort from the community. And the vast majority of the tables will be Vanguard Tactics terrain. I don't want you guys thinking that you're showing up and you're going to be playing on a bunch of styrofoam that's been cut out the night before. It's all very beautiful terrain. It's it's well done. It fills out the board nicely. But this event would not have happened without help from the community. It just, it wouldn't. There is no one here that has that kind of, any single one person that has all of that terrain and the ability to do all of that. So I personally want to just reach out to everybody and say, thank you. I, I can't do it without you. So. Well, definitely thank you to everybody who's contributing because really, like you said, this isn't this isn't one person's effort. This is a, a reflection of the community's desire to do good. And on, on the subject of raising money and, and, and all the, the prizes and things, you have to be at the event if you want to put in some, some raffles or potentially win some of these prizes. You do not. So we're trying to hammer out the logistics of how we're going to do that. It's kind of hard to to do the auctions and so forth but we have done it in the past so basically people will message the event through facebook messenger or whatever and to simplify things for us and for the donors you don't donate to war games for warriors you pick your charity you say hey i want to donate to fisher house or extra life 
we provide you the link and the whole purpose for that link is is it doesn't it's not to get us credit or anything it just keeps it local like we're raising money for the salt lake fisher house and we're raising money for primary children's here in salt lake so we provide a link to make sure that those donations go directly to those organizations as opposed to the national office where they just kind of get filtered down but the we're absolutely going to have ways that people can auc- participate in the auctions, raffles. If you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to the email address wargames for warriors at gmail.com. So that's W A R G A M E S F O R W A R R I O rs at gmail.com so war games for warriors and we'll get you we'll get you the information you need if you have an auction you want to participate in if there's a raffle you want to participate in there's going to be a couple of different raffles we are going to have raffles for several different items like the indominus box and some other stuff but there's also going to be a raffle specifically full of prize pool for the participants at the event So I don't want participants thinking they're all going away empty handed. We're going to try and spread the love out as much as we possibly can. So there will be a prize pool specifically for that as well. Well, awesome. I think now's a good time for me to unveil the specific prizes I've been able to track down. And on behalf of the Chief Librarian podcast and more just also on behalf of these authors who have so very graciously agreed to take the time to send in ship and sign these these novels for us I'll, I'll go ahead and list list off what i've been able to track down i have contributions from graham mcneil guy haley and darius hinks that i can add to the pile uh, from graham i have the blood of the emperor anthology signed the elves omnibus signed the crimson king signed and the warhammer horror series the harrowed paths novel signed as well so that's pretty cool from guy haley I have a Korax 30k novel, a Pharos 30k novel, a Bane Blade. It, all of these are hardback so far. Uh, Wolf's Bane and Rise of the Horned Rat, as well as Sons of Sanguinius, Death of the Old World, and The Call of Archeon. Beyond that, we also should be able to uh, offer, based on what I've been able to find, it's it's taken some it's taken some effort to find some of these out of print books to just get sent over and and signed. I want to thank Greg Dan from the Imperial Truth Podcast for helping me locate some of the the novels I was looking to get signed. But for all you Blood Angel fans out there, we should have uh, another Darkness in the Blood, a signed copy from Guy Haley, as well as we, I believe we'll have a signed copy of Devastation of Ball as well. So I'll have that final confirmation once, uh, once all the books make it to Guy and then he can sign them and then he can send send the list off to me which should be soon uh these are all books that everybody should bid on and then from from darius we have the uh, a signed copy of signs of the emperor and we have a signed copy of ghoul slayer which is a, a gotrick gurnison story i i would have to say that gotrick is my favorite old world fantasy slash age of sigmar character i just love this dwarf he's just grumpy and determined and he just won't die I love him so much. And then there's a short story anthology called Thunderstrike and other stories that Darius is signing as well. So we're going to add those to the prize pool that people will be able to uh, purchase tickets for and get copies of. So if it's something that you're interested in having, I will make sure that the links to the two charities are in the show notes, as well as the email address that Mario specified. And we will... Also put the event link in in there as well. Now, when when is the charity taking place, Mario? So the event itself is taking place the 14th and 15th of August. And we are and th- just so you guys know, all that stuff we went over that is not all inclusive of prize support. Um, we are doing everything we can to continue to get more and more surprise support, surprise, more prize support. <laughs> uh all the way up until the day of the event. So I do, I've got several more places that I'm speaking to, several more commitments and stuff that I have to pick up. So there is going to be a lot more. And the day of, we will be streaming the event. I currently have two streamers. One of them 
is a local community member and the another is a gentleman who I guess he's trying to get his business going. But we will have a stream for the event. So you will be able to watch at a minimum the top table. But we will have all six rounds streamed. Well, you know, there's nothing like a stream to to stir up attention and controversy as someone inevitably gets something wrong. Am I right? You are absolutely correct, sir. And that is why all of my tables that are on stream will be actively judged by an ITC judge. So <laughs> well, I will <laughs> make coming... sure that I that I <laughs> if... don't get on stream as an ITC judge and embarrass myself in front of the entire community. <laughs> If you manage to make it to the top table and accidentally do something shady, not only will the world know, but I'll have someone there to call you on it instantly. <laughs> well, me playing my Blood Angels, I'm sure there's a very, very small chance of me making it to the top table. Uh, unless, I don't know, game one top table, because everybody's tied and I just kind of draw lots. I don't know. It's probably not going to happen. But it should be entertaining and fun to watch anyway. Well, that's awesome. Well, Mario, oh. thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about Board Games for Warriors. I really want everybody out there to know that there's some really cool stuff that you could possibly get, and you could do so by donating to a good cause. And like Mario said, you're donating directly to the charities. None of this is going to pay back-end costs. Nobody's lining their pockets with this. This is straight up. We're trying to do good here. So thank you very much for coming and talking to me about it. No, thank you for having me, and thank you for giving me a little bit of time to let everybody know about the event. Fantastic. Well, Mario, thanks so much for coming on. Everybody at home, I hope you have a great time, and we will see you on the next episode of The Chief Librarian. Parting is such sweet sorrow, but alas, episode one is coming to an end. I'd like to thank everybody who listened all the way through to this point. I hope that you like the show. I know that for a lore podcast, this had surprisingly little focused lore discussion, but we will be having a special segment about lore in the next show, specifically talking about Enuncia, which is kind of a magic language in Warhammer. And we'll talk about kind of the, the lore and the history of it and also some ways to build it into your games and your campaigns. So so that should be an interesting little segment there. Enuncia isn't something that I really hear talked about a lot in lore circles. So I'm really looking forward to digging into it and I hope you guys enjoy that section. I also hope to have a, another crusade conversation with an experienced crusade player talking about his impressions and things. And if the stars align, I'll be able to have a short segment featuring some gaming or conversation between me and Kicker from Signals from the Frontline. Kicker is one of the most enthusiastic people I've ever met, and so talking to him is always a lot of fun. So there's something to look forward to for next week. So far as my own personal hobby goals going into the next show slash month, I have a ton of units I got to paint up for War Games for Warriors. I don't know if I'll even be using all of them, but I need to get them painted. So I'm working on some Primaris Eliminators with Blast Fusils, a Redemptor Dreadnought, a unit of Hellblasters, and a Primaris Chaplain on Bike. Now, I'm going to take this moment to just give a little grief to the game designers over the Primaris Chaplain on Bike because it's dumb. Especially when you have, you know, like a regular Chaplain with a Jump Pack, which is the type that I would want to use. And it's only 10 points cheaper than a Primaris Chaplain on bike who has extra wounds, extra toughness, extra attacks. He can, I think he can even do more of his oratory skills and things. It just, it doesn't make sense to have a regular jump pack dude when for 10 more points you can just have this essentially like a, a bullet with wheels. Anyway, that being said, my own personal gripes aside, I will be building one and trying to convert him into something that I really like so that I can get passionate about playing them. Aside from that, uh, I am going to be doing some more work on the Crusade campaign. 
the Diadem War that we talked about in the first segment. I have mostly built out the book at this point. Well, book is a is a generous word for it. I've written all the words and gotten most of the rules together and having the crew look it over so that everybody can kind of consent to the rules of that before we get started and submit any feedback. All of that's going to wait until after the charity is over just because all of us are super busy hobby-wise trying to get that done. So that is what we have coming up. That's my own personal hobby goals and progress, and I hope to see you next time here in the Librarius. Hey, you. Yes, you. Right there. You are listening to the Frontline Gaming Network. So what does that mean? That means that you have access to a bunch of different and interesting shows. Right now, I'm listening to a lot of Signals from the Frontline because who has time nowadays to follow on your own and get all of the latest news in the gaming hobby? It is streamed every Wednesday, and I never catch it for the stream, but I do catch it later. I especially enjoy Kicker's commentary. He is 40k hype man USA, and I challenge anyone, I dare you, to try and prove me wrong or to upstage the hype that is Kicker Kalosny. So, with my recommendation in hand, go and listen to Signals from the Frontline on the Frontline Gaming Network. This is Chris Morgan, and you're listening to The Chief Librarian, a Creative Commons podcast, some rights reserved.